Translation is in this sort of space of so-called AI complete problems. So solving it would be equivalent to the advent of you know strong AI, if you will, because world for any particular translation problem, world knowledge is required to solve the problem. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world, and I'm your host Lucas Bewald. Spence Green is a machine translation researcher and also the CEO of a startup called Lilt, which is a leading language translation services company. He has been using TensorFlow since the very beginning and has been putting deep learning models into production for longer than almost any of us. I'm super excited to talk to him today. I think the best place to start here is, you know, you're the CEO of Lilt and, <laughs> and you built Lilt. Maybe you could just give us a description of what Lilt is and, and what it does. Well, I think it's important to sort of say where the company came from and the problem that it solves. And then, I, you know, I can kind of explain what it does. I think what it does follows from that. And Perfect. Yeah, that's great. Where it started, at least for me personally, in my mid-20s, I decided I wanted to learn a language. And uh, so I moved to the Middle East for about two and a half years. And while I was there, two th important things happened. The first was I learned that, I was, so I was learning Arabic and I had a friend and I was talking to him one night and he said, he, he was like the building watchman in my building. I was talking to him and I was like, what did you do in Egypt where he was from? And he said, I was an accountant. And I said, oh really, why weren't, why weren't you an accountant here? And he said, cause I don't speak English. I was like, okay, well, we're in an Arabic speaking country and you can't get a job as an accountant. And it's because there's, you, you just like, can't get that people make a certain amount of money if they speak English. If they don't, they make less. And I'd never really encountered that before. And like six months, but six months or so after that conversation, Google Translate came out and I got really excited about that. And um, so I left, I left my job, went to grad school uh, and started working on MT. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of years later, I was at Google working on Translate where I met John, my now co-founder and uh, Franzach who started the group at Google and did all the really early pioneering work in statistical MT. And we, we were originally like talking about books a lot and why do books don't get translated. And we found that Google's like localization team that did all of their language related work for the products didn't use Google translate. And this was kind of, this was kind of amazing to me. Like, why would this be? And, and the reason is, is because in any sort of business setting or non-consumer setting, you need a quality guarantee. And so an MT system can give you, like any machine learning system, it can give you a prediction, but it can't really give you a grounded certificate of correctness about whether it's right. And that's what businesses want or book publishers or whatever. So we started building these human in the loop systems where you need the human for the certificate of correctness, but the crux of the problem is to make that intervention as efficient as you can. I mean, I guess my biggest yeah. question that I was thinking about that I've always wanted to ask you is sort of like how how different is the problem of translating something properly versus sort of setting up a kind of human in the loop system with a human translator to to translate well? Is it almost the same problem, or is it is it quite different? Do you mean by translating like, it properly? What do you mean? I guess I mean so like. Google Translate is just trying to give you the best possible translation. I, I, I sort of assume that what you're doing is is like helping a translator be successful translating something, presumably by kind of guessing likely translations. Yeah, right. So it's a good question. So the question is the mode of interaction with the machine and the way that machine translation systems have been used really since the early 50s was when the this line of research started. It's, it's funny that machine translation was like this really old machine learning task. And originally people thought the digital computers that were developed during the Second World War for well, bomb making and for cryptography, the initial idea was, well, Russian is just English encrypted in Cyrillic. And so we can just decrypt Russian. And so the initial systems that were built in the fifties weren't very good. And so the like naive idea was, well, let's just take the machine output and pay somebody to fix it. Mm -hmm. And that this sort of linear editing workflow is what our work at in grad school was about was like going beyond that in some way, like, like a richer mode of interaction. And what we came up with was effectively a predictive typing interface or there are two problems that we really wanted to solve. One was when you're doing translation, the system makes the same mistake over and over again, documents tend to be pretty repetitive. 
it's an annoying user experience and it's inefficient when the system just makes the wrong prediction over and over again. So the solution to that is to have a system that does online learning, mm -hmm. which was part of the work. And the other was, well, how can you interact with a text string beyond just like using your cursor and fixing parts of it? Mm -hmm. And that is doing predictive typing. So if you put those two together, you want to do online learning and you want to do predictive typing. It's kind of a fundamentally different system architecture than the type of system you build for like Google Translate system architecture. Although it seems fairly close, right? I mean, like the predictive typing, I would think you sort of have like a language model and, and a translation model. Is it sort of the same? Or at least that's how, that's how MT systems used to work, or at least in my memory, right? Is it... That's the way that the statistical systems used to work. And really it was, it came down to doing inference really rapidly. Well, I, yeah, it, it came down to doing inference really rapidly and doing inference with a prefix. So mm -hmm. instead of just decoding a sentence with a null prefix, you send it part of what the translator did. The old systems, we actually had a paper on this a couple of years ago, how to do inference with a prefix was a algorithmic problem that you had to solve. The new new neural systems just do greedy beam search. So it's actually pretty straightforward to to do that these days. And is, is that what you're using? Yeah, it's a, I mean, like everything in NLP these days, it's a transformer architecture and a pretty vanilla one too. What our team really focuses on is a domain adaptation, a rapid and efficient domain adaptation. So we do personalized models either at the user level or at the workflow level for all of our customers. Or, and workflow means, like I said, a document. So you're sort of like learning a specialized model as the, as the, the transition to, happens. I think the way to think about it is more kind of like from your your early days, which is anywhere that you have an annotation standard, you would have a personalized model. So if you think about it in a business, like a marketing workflow has a, has a writing standard that may be different than a legal workflow. Mm -hmm. And so you would have different models for each one of those workflows. I see. And so you're, you're actually training then thousands or more models. Yes, that's correct. And that also has, so that's, that's right. So there are bunches of different models being trained continuously in production all the time right now. And the way that you can think about like the, what the translator does, and I think what's really interesting about this task is in most machine learning settings, like data annotation for supervised learning is some operating costs, you have to pay people to go off and do it. It's an artificial task. Mm -hmm. Translation, you can think about them. They're just doing data labeling. They're reading English sentences and typing French sentences. As soon as they finish that, you just train on it. Right, right. And and do the models get noticeably better over time? Yes. That's super cool. So I guess I'm curious about the sort of like technical details of just making this work. But before getting into that, I want to, I'm curious, like, you started in 2014, is that right? Early 2015, we started 2015. the company. Yeah. So you've seen like such an arc in terms of, I mean, I feel like machine translation has had, it's had such big changes, at least in, like from, from my perspective. Have, has that been sort of like hard to adapt to? Has that like kind of helped you? Have you had to like, you know, kind of learn new skills to, to take advantage of it? <laughs> yeah, it's so the, we you know, we started the company in late 2014 and the system that we had, which we had built at Stanford over the course of about 10 years was competitive with Google mm -hmm. Translate. And so then in December of 2014, you know, the first sort of neural MT paper was published. I mean, people worked on neural MT in the nineties, but it didn't work. And so they sort of got it to work again. There were two papers published, one in December of 2014, the other one in January of 2015. And it was like, you know, pretty promising but nowhere near production ready. And then I think the thing that was really quite shocking was how quickly Google got that into a production scale system, which happened in the late summer of 2016. And so we, you know, at that point, our system was as competitive as anyone. And then suddenly there was this huge leap in translation quality. And so we had to, and we were sort of graduating, all three of us, John and I, and, and a third guy, right at the like at this crossover point. So we didn't really have any empirical experience with these neural machine translation systems. Mm -hmm. So we had to like build a neural MT system from scratch over wow. over the course of about 6 months and we went from the Stanford system was about 120,000 lines of code uh, that uh -huh. had been developed over a decade going to a system that I think was about 
5,700, 6,000 lines of code. And that's amazing. It, it's really, I mean, it's, it's really quite shocking. I mean, a bunch of that is like pushing a lot of the code, you know, pushing a lot of the functionality down into the framework, which everything in the Stanford system was like custom built, you know, so. <laughs> I guess 2016, what framework are you using? Is this cafe or is it even before that? No, we, we, we wrote it in TensorFlow from the beginning. So. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Cool. It, it was, I guess, an okay technology bet. Yeah. I think there's some push to move to PyTorch, but we've got a pretty significant investment in TensorFlow at this point. Yeah, I would think so. And and were you sure that it was going to work? I mean, this seems like a really kind of painful experiment for a startup to do like mid-flight. It was terrible. Yeah. It. I mean, you just kind of had, you kind of had to do it. The results were so compelling. and And I think that MT really is probably of all the tasks within NLP that, you know, deep learning is really revolutionized. I think you really point to make the case that MT is probably the sort of most significant example. Like the recent language modeling work, of course, is, is, is really impressive, but MT just went from being kind of funny to being meaningfully good. And I guess, how did you find enough like parallel corpora to, to make this work? Well, there's quite a bit of public domain data. So, for example, the UN has to publish all of its proceedings in its member languages. There, there are news organizations like the AP that publish in different languages. There are open source projects that, you know, GNOME Project, for example, that publishes all their strings in a bunch of different languages. So you can you can train on all that. And then you've got web crawl, too, which is where most of the training data comes from. I see. I see. It's funny. I, I remember working on MT briefly at Stanford and feeling like it was really unfair that Google had so much more access to data. It does help to have a search engine. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I, I don't know if you came, I mean, I guess if you're mostly doing web crawl, then that makes sense. But I remember just all kinds of weird artifacts from, I think we were training on sort of the EU data that was in all those languages. And it was just such kind of like bias towards like political meanings of yeah. nouns that it, it just seemed like ludicrous sometimes. So that, I think that's in an enterprise setting, that's the real value of domain adaptation. And the second thing that I think is interesting is the legacy approach to enterprise, you know, tr translation within the enterprise is to just build a database of all your past translation. And if you translated something before, you just look mm -hmm. it up in the corpus and retrieve it. Otherwise, you send it off to a vendor. Mm -hmm. So big companies that have been doing translation for decades have this big corpus that they've built up. And um, so we train on that too. And, uh, and, and that, that sort of customer specific training is where you get the real improvement versus just a big general domain system. I guess at the end of the day, like how much, I mean, is, is your sort of, do you measure your results in like how, how fast you can get a translation done? Is that kind of your core metric? And, and I guess if so, how does that change with the quality of the, the translation? Like, do you kind of get diminishing returns or as it gets close to perfect, can someone just like cruise through a translation? Well, I think that there are, maybe I should say a few sentences about, you know, what the, how the customers how a customer would work with us. Sure, so sure. an example of one of our customers is Intel. Mm -hmm. And if you go to intel.com in the top right corner, there's a drop down, and you can change it into 16. You can change the site into 16 different languages and that's all of our, our work. So, so that's, and, and so if you start looking that way, you'll see translation all around you. You'll see it on websites. You'll see it in mobile apps. You'll see it when you get on the airplane and like get, 10 language options for the in-flight entertainment system. That's where this can be used. And right now it's a problem that you can solve with people. Like you can hire people to solve it. The problem is, is like the number of, the amount of information that's being produced is far exceeds the number of people that are being produced in the world right now. And so you can't just solve it with, you know, just with throwing bodies at it. And so that's why you need some automation. So an example of like that Intel website there's from their side, what they just see is us delivering words. Mm -hmm. And the only real metrics that matter are how quickly that gets done and the quality level that it gets done at. And they don't really care whether it's machines or lemmings or whatever is doing the translation work. On our side, it's 
the whole name of the game is using using automation to reduce the production cost and the mm -hmm. the production cost per word and so the, when you produce a word to give to an enterprise there's a translation cost and a QA cost and a workflow routing cost and there's a software hosting cost there's you know a bunch of different cost buckets and it's uh -huh. just minimizing that but i would think that am i wrong that the majority of the cost would be the human that's doing the the translation that's exactly right so then the metrics that we care about internally have to do with making that part more efficient but that's not something that it translates into business value and then it reduces reduces the cost of what we provide to customers and it makes it faster. But those mm -hmm. metrics are not the same metrics that our customers care about. Are there cases where kind of like you worry about with like a self-driving car where like, you know, someone like it's so good that, you know, they, they stop watching and then the car crashes. Like, is it, does your translation ever get so good that you worry that an annotator might just start accepting like every prediction and quality might suffer? Yeah, this is a good question. I think it's more of a risk, and this bears out empirically in the linear post-editing workflow that I mentioned, where I just give you some machine output for some random machine and ask you to correct it. And it's like not very, it's kind of a passive task and cognitively it's not very engaging. Mm -hmm. And so people tend to just kind of gloss through that and make mistakes. Whereas in the predictive typing, it's like an active engaged task. And uh -huh. so if they're basically cheating there, then it comes down to performance management on our part of, whoa, this person did, you know, 2000 words in 10 seconds. Like that <laughs> doesn't seem, <laughs> that doesn't seem right. <laughs> so you can kind of monitor that. And how do customers think about the, the quality? Is it sort of like an intuitive feel for it? Or are they like spot checking it? Or how, how does that work? It's... I think it's again in the same realm of an annotation standard, like like your like your world, where you work with we work with the customer to define what we call a text specification, which is what are the text requirements within each language, and that usually follows from marketing guidelines. They have their brand and style and copy editing guidelines, and then how does that manifest in Chinese and Japanese and German and French? Mm -hmm. And so then we have a QA process where we have raters go in and rate the sentences according to that framework. Mm -hmm. And and then that's what we deliver back to them. Oh, so you don't just deliver the, you don't just deliver the result. You deliver an estimate of the quality based yeah. on raters. Oh, yeah. so that, that's cool. They must, they must appreciate that. Or is that industry mm -hmm. standard to do that? No. Ah, cool. There's some, there's some, um, vendors that are, you know, they'll implement like a scorecard and they'll give you the scorecard back with the deliverable, but we just try to keep it. We just count the number of sentences where, you know, there's some annotation error and then we fix those, but it gives you some sense for like what the overall error rate is. Got it. So I guess I'm sure you've seen, you know, I think people have pointed out that, that, you know, like in translation, there, there can be kind of like, ethical issues like i think people noticed that you know google was was in languages where the protein the pronouns aren't you know gender specific kind of making yeah. them key for sort of like traditionally male occupations is that something that you like think about or like incorporate into your models at all well i mean i think the nice i mean so i'll just give you you know part of my work in grad school was on on arabic and when you work with, you know, Arabic corpora, there's almost all male pronouns because it's coming from Newswire and most of the people who are active politically in the Arab world are male. So mm -hmm. that's the representation in the data. And so systems will tend to predict, you know, masculine and pronouns for lots of different things. But then the human in the loop model, you have people who are there correcting that and they, they, can use the suggestion or not. And by that annotation, you'll get a different statistical trend that the system will start to learn. I see. So it's sort of self-correcting. Mm, cool. I guess I guess I really am interested to know about the the technical details of your your system as much as you can share. I mean, you were a super early user of TensorFlow and you have all these models running in production. I mean, can you like at a high level just sort of tell me like 
how this system works and how it's evolved? Like, do you use like TensorFlow serving to to serve these up, or how do you even how do you even like run all these models in production at once? Yeah, it's an interesting. So, I think that the maybe the most interesting part of it is how do you to the the interesting cloud problem to solve of which there are are several but i think the big ones are you have a budget if you're implementing predictive typing you have a budget of about 200 milliseconds before the suggestions feel sluggish mm. and so that means that the speed of light starts to become a problem and so you have to have a multi region setup because our our community of people who are working are all over the world. You usually hire translators within their linguistic community that are fluent in that native language. So we have people all over the world. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is it has to be a multi-region system. The second is it's a, it's a, it's doing online learning. So you have to coordinate model updates across regions. And the third thing that I think is interesting is to make, you know, to make inference fast commonly like in a big large scale system like Google Translate, you'll batch a bunch of requests, put it on, you know, custom hardware, run it and then return it. But if you're switching in personalized models to the decoder, basically on every request, then you have to run on the CPU and you have to have a multi-level cache to be pulling these models up and off of uh, cold storage and loading them onto the machine. So that's that's been a lot of the engineering is to make it fast worldwide and to make the learning synchronized worldwide. Hmm. And, and I guess, you know, you mentioned that there's like some notion of like switching to PyTorch. Like why, what would push that at all? This is, this is where my, my expertise, <laughs> like my empirical limitations run into a line. I, I think it, you, you know, like ease of, I, I, the two things that I've heard from our team are, you know, you can prototype faster in PyTorch than in TensorFlow. And then there have been some backwards compatibility issues on the range on the like from TensorFlow one to TensorFlow two. There tend to be a, more breaking changes, and so we've got our system running in some co TensorFlow two compatibility mode with some frozen graphs from before, and so that you know that that's been a little bit of a problem. Has I mean I think one just sort of notable thing from from our perspective has been this sort of like rapid ascendance of of hugging face has that been relevant to you at all do you use it anywhere we don't i think when it's funny when when that paper when the transformer paper came out i i i went to grad school you know ashish was vaswani was a contemporary at grad school and then jakob Uskarite was has been a great friend of our company and so we kind of called jakob the next day and we're like let's talk about this and so we talked it through and we started working on it and it, it's a really tricky, it was a really tricky model to get working correctly. Mm -hmm. And it took some time. So we started, I think that paper came on on like a Tuesday if memory served. And I think Jorn started working on the implementation on like Wednesday morning, wow. something like that. And it, you know, before it was like December or January before we had like a working model. And mm -hmm. I think their tensor to tensor release, you know, helped a lot. There's some of the black magic is in there that helped. So this was like 27, mid 2017, mm -hmm. but it, it's, you know, it's, it's tricky to get working right in production. So I think having a library that, you know, people can use more broadly that may not have the, the same, you know, internal resources to get these systems working. It's, it's really, really, really valuable. Totally. Totally. Do, do you think that given your, like, do your sort of like latency and throughput requirements mean that your models are different at all than than what a Google Translate might use? Yes. The, if you're running on custom hardware, you can, of course, afford to run, you know, higher dimensional and more expressive models. So we have to do quite a bit of work with knowledge distillation to try to compress the models so that inference is fast on the CPU. We've also been, it's also been really helpful. Intel is one of our investors. And so their technical teams have helped us with some optimizations to make it run faster on, on, on the CPU. And that's been really valuable. That's cool. Do, do you use different models at all for different language pairs? It's kind of, yeah, the answer, the short answer is yes. There's, there's a general domain model that for every language pair that the domain adaptation starts from, and it basically just forks off of that. 
and then the the model fork starts learning. And so we change the general domain models much less frequently. And so we just actually yesterday released new models for English to Japanese and Japanese to English. And one of the researchers has been working on much deeper, a much deeper encoders. So I think the one that came out yesterday has like a 12 layer encoder, whereas historically we've been running like a four layer encoder or something like that. So now over the, over the, you know, the next little bit, we'll be moving more of our general dam- domain models to, you know, some of the, the current state of the model architecture. And your general domain models, though, those are different for each language pair, right? Or is there sort of yes. one? Oh, that's, that's, that's an important point. So one of the, I think one of the most exciting papers in the last couple of years was, you know, training multi-source, multi-target models. And so mm-hmm. Google had a paper, you know, it was last year or the year before, where they just like piled all the corpora together and trained this huge neural network. And this is really hard to think about coming from, you know, the statistical MT days, because it's just like, crazy to do in, 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 in a statistical MT system, but we use some groups of languages. So we'll group similar languages, uh, especially if they're low resource languages and we don't have much data. And then you'll have a system that's for, you know, five different languages or so. But well, there's something about that that's like so appealing. Like I, I, I mean, I, I'm way out of date, so I, I never saw that working when I was in grad school, but I love the yeah. idea of it. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a really attractive idea, and it sounds like it's it's actually kind of working. It does work, yeah. So I guess I don't know how much you feel, you know, comfortable expounding on this topic, but I'm I'm like really curious. Like, I mean, do you how do you have a feeling on how far MT goes? Like, do do you think that human level MT is 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 realistic? Like, you know, it's funny when you talk about companies wanting like quality guarantees. I mean, I would think just, you know, having used a lot of Google Translate in my life, you know, quality guarantees seem like would be useful, but also it just seems like the quality of Google Translate just isn't good enough that I would want to put that, you know, on my website generally. Like, do you expect that that is likely to change? Yeah, I I guess I can offer like some sort of assorted comments on thinking Please. about that. <laughs> Thank you. In no particular order, because I think they're both technical and sort of social issues to do with that. And I think there's there's some some like philosophical issues. So so let's start with the philosophical issue. You know, translation is in this sort of space of so-called AI complete problems. So solving it would be equivalent to the advent of, you know, strong AI, if you will, because world for any particular translation problem, world knowledge is required to solve the problem. And, and there, are, there are inputs that are not in the string that are required to produce a translation in another language. Although, sorry to cut you off, but I, I guess it feels like based on what I've seen lately from Google Translate that it feels like less AI complete than I would have thought. Yes. So that's the next comment that I'll make, which is that philosophical statement does not, doesn't, mean that it, within business settings, you should not be using it. And, and I'll give you an example. So one space we've been looking at recently is like crypto. Well, like four months ago, like nobody knew what a non-fungible token is. So like, how do you translate that into Swahili and Korean? Well, an empty system is not going to give you the answer to that question because language is productive. People are making new words all the time. And mm-hmm. machines are not making up new words all the time. People are. And so philosophically, you've got to have training data for the system to be able to produce a result. People do not need training data to do that. So, but then I think increasingly there are a lot of business settings where it's good enough to solve the problem. So, you know, if you go for years, you can go to Airbnb and look at a flat and click translate with Google and it'll give you a translation. It may not be perfect, but Mm -hmm. it's certainly enough to convince you, you want to buy this, you know, rent, rent this flat. And I think there will be more and more cases where fully automatic machine translation solves uh, the business problem at hand. I think mm-hmm. that's absolutely true. And then I think there's a third part of it, which is sort of social and organizational, which is how soon, you know, VP of marketing, are you willing to let raw machine translation go on your landing page with no oversight? Uh huh. And that's, one way to think about that is like, how soon are you, Lucas, ready for a machine to respond to all of your email? All of my own email. Yeah. 
Well, you know, I have to say some of it, probably sure, but like (laughs) others parts of it, a little bit, a little bit dangerous. I mean, this might be kind of an off the wall question, but I have noticed my, I think I have a slightly more polite writing style because of Google's like predictive text algorithm. Like I kind of wonder if you're slightly shaping the translations with, with your predictions, even if the translator is kind of getting involved and sort of making it match. Um, oh yes, this is a, this is called priming. So it's a it's a, a common feature of psychological research. And so one of the things that we showed in grad school is when you show somebody a suggestion, they tend to generate a final answer that's closer to the suggestion than if they start from scratch. Uh-huh. So I guess there's some. I mean, I guess it's like maybe it's better that I write slightly more politely. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's some good that you could. Well, do it's it. pulling your it's pulling your writing down to mean behavior. So uh, you know, a mean level of performance. So I'm not sure if that's great or not. Pulling down or pulling up. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, or maybe it's pulling you up to a mean level of performance. Right. Do you, Do you think that the translators kind of learn to use your system as well? Like, do you see productivity going up for an individual that's doing this? Yeah, this is, so this, we have an HCI team and this is one of the main things that they're working on right now, which is, I think, yeah, I think, (laughs) I remember right when we started the company, one of my co-advisors, Jeff Hare, who started Trifacta, I was telling him, this was like really early on and I was showing him like some of the stuff we were building and we want to optimize this and we want to do that. And he said, let me stop you right there. In the early days of a company, you're just trying to make things less horrible than they are than they are. And <laughs> and and you're gonna be in that phase for a long time. And before you sort of get to the optimization phase. So I think for a lot of the last number of years, it was like, you know, catching up on neural MT, making the system faster, multi-region, like making the system more responsive in the browser. And there was just like a lot of unbreaking work that was going on. And now um, we've got some pretty convincing results that the the highest, you know, the highest, the thing that we really ought to focus on is how people use the system. That mm-hmm. the greatest, you know, the greatest predictive variable of performance is just like the individual's identity. And so when we look at how people use it, there's really high variance in the degree to which they utilize the suggestions, how they use the different input devices on the keyboard, you know, how they navigate and work through a document. So the team's spending quite a bit of time on user training right now, actually. Oh, so user training, not like modifying the interface, but actually training people to use User training, it. yeah. Interesting. Do you, have you ever considered doing like multiple suggestions? Like, is that possibly better? Or? Yeah, we, the, one of the reasons that this sort of predictive approach to MT didn't work really well is because people, the interfaces that were built up until our, you know, our work, they use like a drop-down box. Mm-hmm. And it turns out when you put stuff on the screen, people read it, which slows <laughs> them down. So what you want to do is show them the one best prediction. That's the very best prediction you can show them. I see. Interesting. I, I think I bet that's especially true when you're confident in your, in your predictions. Yeah. Cool. Is there any other surprises in terms of like your interfacing with, with humans? I feel like my last company was like a labeling company. I just had all these like kind of interesting ways that the interaction between humans and machines surprised me. Has, has it has like the way that you engage with the human changed at all over the years that you, you're running this besides training? Maybe one of the biggest things that we learned is that historically within translation, you know, you know, in this translation world, I mentioned this, you know, MT work goes back to the fifties. So in professional translation is a, you know, I don't know, it predates agriculture or something. That's like really <laughs> an old profession. Right. And sure. so these people have been engaged with AI systems for like 50 years. And for most of that period of time, the systems are really bad. <laughs> so, so there's like kind of a lot of bias against these systems and people, especially those who used them for a while when they weren't really good, like they were kind of reluctant to try them. I think more broadly now people are using them because MT is a lot better, but we found that, you know, resistance to change was really significant. And the way to get around that was to align incentives better with the business model, which, okay, what do people actually want more than they want to not like embrace machine learning. Well, they want to get paid. They want to be recognized for their work. They want to be appreciated. They want to have a good work environment and work with good people. And Mm -hmm. so I think we found that built focusing on those things when you did, when you do those right, 
then people are really open to, let me try this automation, you know, let me, I'm okay with the fact that you're changing the interface every week and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Is is there like a feedback loop with the the ratings? I would think that might be an important thing too, if you're then kind of rating the, the quality of the transition. Yes. So this is, uh, we have, I believe it, we just submitted a paper to EMNLP. Hopefully it'll get in. And we've been nice. working on a bilingual grammatical error correction. So what the reviewers do, you can think of as another review step. So <laughs> we took an English input, we generated some French, maybe there's some bugs in the French. And we give that to another person who then is going to find and fix those bugs, or maybe they make some stylistic changes or like, who knows what they do. So that just becomes another prediction problem with two inputs, the English and the un- Cor- corrected unverified input. French or whatever you want to call it. And uh-huh. they're going to predict the verified French. Mm-hmm. And so you can use a sequence prediction you know, architecture or, you know, model for that, or you can use sequence modeling for that. And so... The team's been working on that for about the past year and a half, and they've, you know, they've sort of got it working now. And we'll, we announced that like last fall, and we'll have it in production. I think, you know, sometime in the second half of the year. Wow, that's so cool. And and I guess in production, what would that mean? Like once you finish editing a document, it sort of goes through and makes suggestions. Yeah, it'll it'll it, it's a fancy it's a fancy grammar checker. Only it's a grammar checker that's data oriented instead of based on rules. And it can learn things, you know, it can learn simple phenomenon like spelling mistakes, but it can also learn stylistic edits. Well, it sounds like it's also incorporating the source language too, right? Yeah. So that's how it's different than like a Grammarly or the, you know, the the grammar checker that you have in Google Docs or whatever. And that instead of, you know, you only have one language to look at, the string that you're generating is constrained by this other source language input. So you can't just right, like... Right generate anything you've got this sort of very strict constraint which is the source language and and do you plan to like do a separate one for every single document stream or work stream that that you have yes you can use the same infrastructure for that that you use for the translation that's so cool well cool so we always end with two questions and i want to give you a little time to to chew on these i guess one is kind of open ended, but I, I'd be interested in your thoughts in MT specifically. Is is you know what's what's like an underrated aspect of machine learning or or, or machine translation that you think people should may, pay more attention to, or that you'd be thinking about if you weren't working on Lilt? Maybe it's around the question that you posed earlier, which is this sort of human parity question with translation. Which there was a paper I don't know two years ago. Microsoft had a paper saying. Human parity has been achieved. And then, you know, two weeks ago, Google published a paper on archive saying who human parity has not been achieved. <laughs> and I think that in in our, you know, in our application, there's a lot to translation quality, which is like the particular message that you're trying to deliver to an audience, which a lot has to do like how the audience feels. Mm-hmm. And certainly in my time in grad school, I was really focused on just like generating the output that matches the reference. So the blue score goes up and I can write a paper. And I think there's a lot of interesting work to think about, you know, broader pragmatic context of the language that's generated and is it appropriate for the context that you're in and for the domain. And that's really hard to evaluate, but it's 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 really worth thinking about whether it's in natural language generation or machine translation or, or whatever else. So So I think maybe thinking about that a little bit harder, I would spend some time on. Yeah, the blue score is funny because it seems like such a sad metric for translation. Like it makes sense that it works, but it just seems so like ludicrously simple. It's hard to, I mean, at some point, I feel like it must sort of lose meaning is the best possible metric, right? Well, people studied it a lot. And, you know, I think the conclusion was that it's the least bad thing that we've come up with. And it's over two, you know, two decades of study, it continued to be the least. Nobody could come up with anything that was, that was <laughs> as convenient and correlated better with human judgment. So maybe it's a testament to, you know, a simple idea that you know people are still using twenty years later. Or I guess like simple metrics are better than complicated metrics. There might be there might be a lesson for business. There, there might be a lesson there too. Yeah. But I guess the final question we always ask: What's the biggest challenge of machine learning in the real world? But I'd like to tailor it to you a bit of just like. 
what's been the hardest part of getting these language models to work in production? You touched on it a bit, but I'd love to hear, especially any part that might be surprising to, you know, yourself as an academic, you know, before starting the company, like where have the challenges been? Yeah. If I think back to when we started the company, the research prototype that we had, you could translate, you had to special, you had to, you had to specialize it to one document. So like, if you're going to translate a document, you had to compile this part of it and then load it into a production system and you could send it the document and it would translate it. And if you sent it anything else, it basically wouldn't work. And I remember when we raised money for the company, I told the investors, I was like, yeah, we're going to take this prototype and have a production product in like six weeks or something. And what actually happened is it took us nine months and the problems we had to solve turned into an ACL paper. (laughs) And this is, you should not do this. This is very bad. And I think I really underestimated how, how far it is from like kind of a research prototype that's actually a pretty effective system to an MVP for something like what we do, which is taking any document from any company and generating a reasonable output and doing that with like the learning turned on and the inference and all that stuff, like getting to a, you know, a large scale production system, which is probably not surprising to anybody who worked at, you know, who's worked in these production scale MT systems, but the amount of detailed large scale engineering work that has to go into that is, was surprising to us. I think even having worked on Google Translate and uh, well, can you so, give me an example? Like, what what was something you ran into? Because it, it it does seem like that shouldn't take nine months. Like, what what came up? Well, in 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 those days, in that original system, it was you had to you had to be able to load the entire by text into memory, so the systems stored words as atomic strings. And you had to have all the strings in memory to be able to generate a translation. So we did a lot of work on comp, what's called a compact translation model, where you can load the entire bytext into a running production node, and the lookups happen fast enough that you can generate an output. Mm-hmm. I think in the neural setting, what's been really challenging is you can't do batching, and you know you can't just like put it on a GPU or a TPU because the latency constraint that you have. So that's meant a lot of work on CPU inference, on the way the production infrastructure swaps personalized models off onto and uh, off of the production nodes. And it seems like conceptually really simple, but when you actually get down into it, you're like, wow, we've been at this for two months and we're still not quite there yet. What's happening? And that's sort of been our experience, I think. Interesting. And I guess at the time, there was probably a lot less stuff to help you. Yeah, there was no Kubernetes, you know, there was no, none none of that type of infrastructure. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. This is really fun. And and thanks for sharing so much about how your company operates. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for, it's always good to chat with you. If you're enjoying Gradient Descent, I'd really love for you to check out Fully Connected, which is an inclusive machine learning community that we're building to let everyone know about all the stuff going on in ML and all the new research coming out. If you go to wmb.ai slash fc, you can see all the different stuff that we do, including Gradient Descent, but also salons where we talk about new research and folks share insights, AMAs where you can directly connect with members of our community, and a Slack channel where you can get answers to everything from very basic questions about ML to bug reports on weights and biases to uh, how to hire an ML team. We're looking forward to meeting you.